so thankful for this time when we're able to come together and worship our holy God. And uh, it's so wonderful to hear all of us singing together. Uh, congregational singing is so powerful when the voices of believers blend together and we sing the song of the redeemed. It is such a wonderful, there's nothing like that on the face of the earth. Praise God. I thank God for that. I love it sometimes when they get the music really low where I can hear all of us singing together. That is such a beautiful thing. Uh, praise God for that. really want to thank all of you uh, for praying for me as I was in Florida for the last couple of days, uh, ministering God's word at the convention there. Um, sometimes in certain meetings, um, the ministry of God's word happens in such a powerful way. Even beyond anything that I can do on my own or based on my preparation or prayer, then I really know that people are praying. And, and I'm so thankful that we had fasting prayer in our church for the last couple of days where you, I know that earnestly prayed for my ministry in Florida and it was so evident in the way God was able to use his word to minister and the hearts of the people there. So thank you so much for praying. Pray for God's blessings upon you. We continue with our series this morning. Uh, in the afternoon, Church on the Rise, and we turn God's word into Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Let me read God's word for you. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Last week, we were introduced to this man who was chosen among the seven to serve on the table. We talked about the fact of how there was a need in the church and the Holy Spirit had led the apostles to choose these seven men from among the congregation and the first person in that list and probably the most important one as we will see here in a minute was a man by the name of Stephen whose name means crown or victor's crown. And now the Holy Spirit through Luke gives us more of an introduction to what is about to happen. Verse 7 was a happy verse, wasn't it? The word of God was spreading. The number of disciples in Jerusalem was increasing rapidly. And even a large number of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And then Luke tells us, verse 8, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. A man full of grace and the power of God. There is only one other place in God's word where someone is called of having full of grace. In fact, in our Sunday school class this morning, we talked about it from John chapter 1 verse 14. Jesus is introduced to us by John the Apostle as a man who became, it was God who became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. And then he says, we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. And now, the same description is given to us about the life of Stephen as well. Full of grace and full of power. Isn't it amazing that those who follow Jesus take on his very nature? Here is our Lord who is full of grace. And here is a faithful follower of Jesus, Stephen, also having the same quality as his master, being full of grace and power. What does it mean by full of grace and full of power? 
it doesn't just mean that he is filled to the brim with these two great qualities, grace of the Lord and power that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. It means literally to be controlled by these things. Here's a man who was led by the grace of God, controlled by the grace of God, and the grace of God was overflowing through him in everything that he did and everything that he said, and it was so evident. And the Holy Spirit tells us he was also a man who was full of power of the Spirit of God, controlled by the Spirit of God. And when you are led by the grace of God, when you're led by the power of God, God will enable you to do things that you are not able to do on your natural self. That's exactly what we see in verse 8. He performed great wonders and signs among the people. He was able to perform great wonders and signs because of the immense grace and power that was flowing through his life. But do you know what happens? Anytime a man of God is full of grace and power, there are kind of two uh, responses that the world will, or the people around will have to him. Some people will love him, and some people will just absolutely hate him. Exactly what we see in verse 9. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. So it is impossible for the world to stay neutral uh, when God's grace and power are in full display. And so here, unfortunately in this case, what they choose to do, at least the people of the synagogues, was to rise up and the Bible says they start arguing. The rightful translation is they started debating him with him. And there are five groups of people that are mentioned to us in Acts chapter 6 verse 9. I will divide that up for you a little bit. Synagogue of the freedmen. Who are this synagogue of the freedmen? The idea here is that when Pompey took many Jews as captives in B.C. 63, he took them back to Rome and they became slaves of the Roman Empire. After a while, they were set free by the Roman Empire. They came back to Jerusalem and they established their own synagogue. Because they were children of the slaves who were now set free, they labeled their church the synagogue of the freedmen. They're like, you know, we have a different background. Uh, our fathers were slave, slaves and now we are freed. We want our own church. Now, one writing says there were 480 synagogues just in the vicinity of Jerusalem during the time of Acts chapter 6. Now, oftentimes we fret about the number of churches, number of Malali churches, number of Pentecostal churches. So just to bring some comfort to your mind, there were 480 synagogues just in that small vicinity at that time. Because all it took to form a synagogue was 10 Jewish men. If you had 10 Jewish men who would agree on one name, you could form a synagogue. Where did all this idea come from? When Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple and take the people of Israel as captives back to Babylon, they did not have a temple to worship in. So what, you know what they did? They started forming small groups where they would come together to read scripture and pray. That was known as a synagogue. When they came back to their promised land, they continued that practice of even though they had a temple now, they will still meet in synagogues. We see the Lord going to synagogues many times in the New Testament. We see the Apostle Paul choosing after synagogue when he went to a new place. If you had 10 men to come together, you could form a synagogue. So you have the synagogue of the freedmen who did not like what Stephen was doing. Then you also have the synagogue of the Cyrenians and Alexandrians. I bunched them together because Cyrene is modern-day Libya. Alexandria is modern-day Egypt. They are both in Africa. So maybe this is talking about the same group of people here. Maybe this is two synagogues that were found in Africa. The synagogues of the Cyrenians, the synagogue of the Alexandrians. Then we have a third group. Synagogues of Cilicia and Asia belonging to the continent of Asia. So you have the synagogue of the freedmen, the synagogue of the Cyrenes and Alexandrians, probably from Africa. And then you have the synagogues of Cilicia and Asia that are coming from the land of the Asia or Asian continent. Now, very interesting, if you're a student of God's word, there's a name in here that should stand out for you. Cilicia. You know who is from Cilicia? The Apostle Paul. Paul of Tarsus, Tarsus meaning the main city in Cilicia, was a origin, a resident, was born, that's his hometown, is Cilicia. Is it possible that when they were arguing with Stephen on that day, one of the people who was leading that debate against him was the apostle Paul 
in Acts chapter 6. We do not know for a fact. One day when we get to heaven, we'll ask him. We know for sure when he was martyred, Paul was there. The Bible records that. But what if even early on in Acts chapter 6, when this debate was going on with Stephen, Paul was leading the debate against Stephen. I think probably was because the Holy Spirit was starting to move in the heart of this man, instilling in him the truth of God's word. And they have certain accusation against Stephen. What is it? Verse 10. They started arguing with him, but there was a problem. The Bible says to us, they could not stand up against the wisdom the Holy Spirit gave him as he spoke. Uh, when you put natural man against a man that is led by the Spirit of God, I'm here to tell you, it is no match. It is an unfair fight. Suddenly, the natural is going up against the supernatural. The wisdom of the world is going against the wisdom the Holy Spirit gives to the believer. And suddenly, even though this large group of people are coming against him, and he is all by himself, the word of God says, they had no stand against his wisdom the Holy Spirit gave to him. If when you go into this world, do not be afraid. You are led by a higher wisdom than the world ever has. When you talk to your coworkers, do not be afraid. You are led by the wisdom of God that is far greater than anything of this world. You might be thinking, I don't have the language, I have a bad accent. None of these things matter. The wisdom of the Holy Spirit is much greater, much more grander, and much more smarter than anything this world could ever give to you. It makes you wiser. It is able to make you stand against the intellectuals of this world. Even today, the highest wisdom that is found is wisdom that comes comes uh, from the leading and the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. Stephen is going up against these people and they're banding against it. God's word says they could not stand up against him. So when they could not beat him in a fair debate, look what they do. They do the same thing they did against our Lord. They try to recruit false witnesses against him, distorting his word. Verse 11, then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard this man, Stephen, speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And I love the way it is arranged in God's word. Their first complaint is that Stephen is speaking against who? Moses. God only comes second. That already shows the priority that is in the mind of these people. Moses is more important to them than God himself. The first complaint that we have is that he's speaking against Moses. If that's not bad enough. Let me tell you something else. He's speaking against God as well. So only if the charge Moses against Moses does not stick, now we'll add God to the picture. See, this shows how misplaced their priority was. And then what did they do? Verse 12. They stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. The word seized that is used over here is the word snatched, where a wolf would go into a pack of sheep and snatch one away. Remember what is happening in God's word up until this point. The apostles were arrested, they were flogged, they were brought here. Suddenly we come to chapter 6, verse 12, and Stephen is violently taken away by the people and brought before the Sanhedrin. This is not them coming and asking Stephen to come with them. It's literally snatching and seizing him away and bringing him before the Sanhedrin. We've already seen what the Sanhedrin looks like. 71 elders of the law, mainly Sadducees, some Pharisees, 70 people belong, some priests, some that are not, one high priest, 71 of them sitting in a raised area, and in the middle of it, the person who is tried is brought together. And Stephen is standing there, all alone, and there's a trial now about to take place. He is in the midst of this trial. Look what they do in verse 13. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. <laughs> this is a good accusation to have. He is never stopping and speaking against this holy place and against the law. You know what they're doing? They're very smart. They're trying to recruit all factions. The holy place is most important to the Sadducees. The law is most important to the Pharisees. They are both in the Sanhedrin. So when they say the charge against Stephen, they say he is not only speaking against the holy place 
And he's also speaking against the law as well. So if you don't care about the holy place, at least care about the law. You all should be banding together against him. Then they told him this, verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the custom Moses handed down to us. We have heard him say something that is so damning. It is this. That this Jesus of Nazareth, and by the way, that is not by accident. They call him Jesus of Nazareth because Nazareth is a bad town. Nazareth is a dirty place. Nazareth is a poor place. Nazareth is a place where the uneducated live. So when they say Jesus of Nazareth, what they're trying to do is put down who Jesus is. And they're saying, this, he's claiming that he's a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. And he says that he will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. I'm thinking here that this was probably right. Stephen was probably speaking to them about what our Lord himself said when he looked at the temple and the grandeur of the temple and said, break this temple down and three days later I will rebuild it again. They thought, well, what are you talking about? It took us 46 years to build this temple and you mean to tell us you will build it again in three days? And the word of God says what? He was talking about his own body that be buried and will three days later will rise again. They did not understand that. But there was a deeper spiritual meaning behind what Jesus was saying. When Jesus said, break this temple down and three days later I will rise it up again. Jesus was telling them about what was about to happen. See, when Jesus died, the temple ceased to exist in the mind of God. And when Jesus rose from the dead, the temple is no more in the mind of God because Jesus has become our temple. Sacrifices now doesn't need to be offered anymore because he has become the ultimate sacrifice. Intercession of the priest is not required anymore because he has become our intermediary between us and God. So when Jesus was saying, break this temple down, three days later, I will build it again. He was not talking about building that same temple. He was talking about a new temple where he himself becomes the temple of the living God among which God's people will live and worship and offer sacrifices in him, believe in his sacrifice forever and ever. Stephen was going around telling them, say, remember what we were reading up until this point. These apostles were hanging out by the temple site. They could not get away from it. They were preaching the temple, which is fine, because that's where the audience was. But they still had some kind of affinity towards the temple. Stephen saw the danger in that. He knew that as long as they hung around the temple, they will cling on to the old customs of the Jewish faith. And he probably started preaching Men of God, women of Israel who are now believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. This temple doesn't matter anymore. These sacrifices don't matter anymore. You don't need to go to the temple anymore. Your body itself has become the temple of God by the Holy Spirit that is living inside of you. So this charge is probably true. And guess what? Stephen was continuously preaching this because he was led by the Spirit of God. Oh, don't you love to be so full of the grace and power of the Holy Spirit that you are boldly, continuously preaching the truth of God's word, not worried about the consequence of what happened to it. Once when uh, D.L. Moody was about to be invited to preach in England one day, one elderly preacher said, why do we need Mr. Moody? He's all the way in America. Why do we need to bring him to England to preach to us. He is uneducated, didn't even finish high school, inexperienced. Who does he think he is anyway? Does he think he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? A younger, wiser pastor rose up and responded, no, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. The Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Pastor Moody, and that's why we need to hear him, because what he speaks is the words the Holy Spirit wants to speak. His education of Moody doesn't matter. His experience doesn't matter, because what we are most interested in is what God has to speak to us, and that comes to us as long as our life is led by the control and power of the Spirit of God. And then we come to the most important verse in this entire passage, verse 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin, remember, 
Here he is in the middle of that that elaborate circular space, the supreme court of the Jewish people, surrounded by 71 people who are gazing upon him. Luke writes to us, all who are sitting in the Sanhedrin, look intently at Stephen. The word there is to gaze upon somebody and to continuously gaze upon them until you get a full idea of what they're looking at. And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Not a word has been spoken yet. Or just his countenance is already speaking volumes to their mind. And what is so interesting about this verse is that the Sadducees do not believe in angels, but yet they look at someone who now has the face of an angel. And not only that, this is the most important thing. Guess who had his face shining in the Old Testament? When Moses came down from the mountain, holding on to the Old Covenant, Exodus chapter 34 tells us his face shone so much that the people of Israel could not even converse with him. They had to put a veil on his face so that Moses could continue speaking to the people. Now comes one who says, the old covenant is gone, the new covenant has come. And as he stands as a representative of the new covenant, God is pouring out his glory into the face of Stephen. And his face is shining like the face of Moses. And now they are accused him of rejecting Moses, but now before him stands one who is looking like Moses. They said, he is telling us to reject Moses. Now he stands and says, yes, Moses is important, but Jesus is more important. And God is making his face shine to prove to them that what he is saying is true. There's a way in which you can be more attractive than you naturally are by being a man and a woman of God. This is something that Botox cannot give to you. This is something that makeups cannot give to you. This is something that no things on earth could ever give to you. There is a possibility in which you can have such a godly character that it shines through your face physically. I have seen this with my own eyes. I have encountered people that I would just naturally ask them, are you a child of God? And almost 100% of the time, they're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ by the way their appearance is even on their face. Uh, do you want to have radiance and glowing glory that the world could never give to you? Do you want to have things that age cannot take away from you? Do you want to have things that pain cannot take away from you? Do you want to have a smile that still is able to smile even in the midst of the darkest moments of your life, that does not come naturally, that comes from the work of the Spirit of God in the soul of man, where even your outside appearance is changed by the glory of God that is working in the soul of man. How do we know this? Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation or a warped and perverse generation, then what will happen to you is this. You will shine among them like stars in the sky. The radiance that God gives to you as you live your life blamelessly and pure in a crooked and perverse generation, you will shine among them like stars in the sky darkness all around, the righteous still shine, and they are noticed by all around them. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, that's what Stephen is, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. What is happening to Stephen as he's standing before the Sanhedrin? What we read about in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14 the spirit of glory and of God resting upon this man of God. I wish I had a picture of Stephen from this trial. Picture of the whole people and Stephen in the middle. All around him are people filled with rage and anger and hatred. You know what that looks like, right? Rage, anger, and hatred. And in the middle, you would expect the prisoner to be anxious, fearful, sweating, kind of wondering what is about to happen, kind of a perplexed, confused look. Oh no, he is standing there smiling with the face of an angel, more happy and radiant than all the people that have come to put him to death. 
because there is a power that is working in him that is able to completely change his disposition. What a glorious picture of a contrast between the child of God and the people of this world. We are people that are different. Why is that? Why do our faces shine? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. The apostle Paul wants you to know this. If the ministry that brought death, that is the ministry of the Old Testament, the ministry of the law, which was engraved in letters of stone, the tablets of stone, came with glory. It came with glory. That's why you could not even touch the mountain. You could not go up on the mountain. You could not look upon the face of Moses who received those tablets of stone because even the, the ministry of death in the Old Testament came with the glory of God because it came from God. But the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of his glory. Transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Here's the question. If the ministry that brought death was glorious, how much more glorious will the ministry of the Spirit that brings eternal life would be? And the answer is, you cannot even compare the two. Look at the next verse. Verse 9. If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Oh, hallelujah. Old Testament was all about condemnation. Stay away, stay away. You are not worthy, you are not worthy. The ministry of the New Testament is one that says, come to God, he will fill you with his righteousness. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul is saying, how much more glorious this ministry is? Then he continues, verse 10 and 11. For what was glorious has no glory, now in comparison with the surpassing glory, and if what was transitory, the old covenant was transitory, was glory, how much more greater is the glory of that which lasts for all eternity? And when you stand as an ambassador, when you stand as a preacher, when you stand as an evangelist, when you stand as a communicator, when you stand as a missionary, when you stand as a faithful witness of this glorious gospel that is eternal in nature, that brings righteousness to the hearts of people, that brings eternal life to them, God's glory rests upon you and even your face become like the face of an angel that is a natural reaction to supernatural things that are happening in the heart of man. This only happens in the Christian faith. Adoniram Jetson was a famous missionary, you know, who took the gospel to Burma. Even today, 600,000 believers in that impoverished, persecuted country trace their origins back to the commitment of one man who left the riches of America and went to be a missionary in Burma. He translated God's word into the Burmese language that is still used today. The Burmese English dictionary that he wrote is the one that we are using to understand the language of God's word even in Burma today. But he suffered a lot. He had to bury his wife, numerous children in the land of Burma. Went many years without a single convert. But the grace of God was so powerful in his life. After being in Burma for many years, he once traveled back to America. And once he was traveling on a train from Boston to Philadelphia. And he made a stop. I don't know if the city is still there. Maybe you can tell me no later. City of Stonington, Connecticut is still there. He made a stop there. And he got out of the train. A young boy who was just 14 years old had read about Adoniram Jetson as a young boy and has always marveled at the missionary work of this of Adoniram Jetson. As he was playing along by the railway station, he sees this man standing there. Suddenly he remembered from the pictures he had seen before that this was Jetson. But this boy was so starstruck that this boy could not say a word. So he ran and found the local Baptist preacher and brought him so he can talk to Jetson. And they started having conversing and this boy it is written in his biography, I was just standing there just staring at him. 
But what he writes is that, I looked at the face of this man who had suffered so much for the Lord, but his face was beaming with a radiant glory not seen among human beings. He said, I look at him and I could not take my eyes off of him. The glory of God was shining through the face of Adoniram Jetson. It made such an impression on this young teenager that he would later become the famous preacher, Henry Clay Trumbull, who took the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to many parts of the world. But all that started with an encounter in that railway station with a missionary who had taken God's word into Burma and come back home. See, it is not only the face of Stephen that is able to shine like the face of an angel. Those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars of the heavens forever. Not only in eternity, but even on this earth. Their countenance, their disposition, their face will reflect the glory of God as they communicate the glorious truths of the eternal gospel that is able to save and redeem mankind. Let's stand in the presence of God. Our Lord is coming back. Soon and very soon it will happen. As I was in Florida for the last couple of days, I saw a hunger among God's people for His coming like never before. And I heard more and more people talking about that our Lord has to come back. Lord, please come back. You know why? This world is becoming more and more evil every day. For the saint, for the believer, this place is becoming less and less of a home every single day. The things of this world doesn't align with our principles, with our attitudes. The things that we see all around us is so contradictory to God's word. This world is becoming much less of a home every single day. But we know He is going to soon come. He's going to come in the clouds. He's going to establish His kingdom on this earth. The Bible tells us that He is a lamb and he is a lion as well. Augustine, when preaching about this idea of Jesus being our lion and lamb, says this. He endured death as a lamb, but he devoured death as a lion. Let me repeat that again. He endured death on the cross as the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But he devoured death in his resurrection as a lion devours death. So today... He is the lamb of our lives in that he takes away our sins. He is the lion of our lives in the sense that he fights our battles. And not only that, he gives us the assurance of victory over death because our Lord is the roaring lion of Judah who has conquered death and death forever. Satan is a roaring lion, but he's a toothless lion. Our Lord is a true lion of Judah who will soon come to establish his kingdom on this earth. So as we sing, worship the one who is the lamb. Worship the one who is the lion. He is worthy of all praise and glory. And let his name alone be lifted up. Praise God.